Hey guys, welcome to the channel. It's Jack with Stronghold Strength and Conditioning. And today, I'm showing you how to fix that knee pain that's right around that kneecap, otherwise known as jumper's knee or patellar tendonitis. But before we get into it, make sure you take a moment, hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on future content like this. Every Thursday, I'm putting out videos showing you how to resolve aches and pains, prevent injuries, and overall optimize your performance. And it doesn't get much cooler than that. So, jump on it. Ready? Go ahead and dive into this one. All right guys, the topic of the day, patellar tendonitis, that knee pain right around the kneecap, pretty much going vertical along the knee here. And if that's not what you're having, then this probably isn't the video for you. So you might wanna try and keep searching. But we're looking at jumper's knee today is what we call it. And the reason being jumper's knee, or the reason it's got its name, is because that's usually where we see it, is in repetitive movements such as running, squatting, lunging, and jumping, believe it or not. And what the problem is, the major mechanical issue at hand that is causing your jumper's knee is movement patterning. The coordination of the movements themselves are off and we tend to rely more on the knees in the movement than we do on the hips. And that is a big issue in itself right there. If you're constantly moving wrong, this is what's gonna be driving this knee pain right at the kneecap itself because we're constantly gonna be overloading the tissues along the front side of the leg. Specifically, rectus femoris. This acts as a double actual action muscle here. So we get hip flexion and we get knee extension from rectus femoris. That also happens to be the tendon that directly runs right into your patella and into that uh, lower patellar tendon where it connects at the tibia there. So this is a muscle that we're very interested in as far as the soft tissues go. But we also need to be looking at what the joints are doing in this movement. So today I'm gonna to be showing you a mobility-based systematic approach to fix your overall patellar tendonitis for the long haul here. So it isn't necessarily an immediate thing, although you may see some immediate relief from it. It is a system that you will have to put in repetition and overall the movement pattern itself is gonna be a part of that where we practice good healthy movement so that we're not overloading those tissues regularly. But we're gonna build it up also systematically so that we're not jumping in too deep of water before we can actually swim here. So that is what you've got coming up here, a mobility-based approach. And if you guys are interested in learning more of just what the systematic approach to mobility is, and even identifying some more underlying issues that might be going on in your body you might not even be aware of, take a moment to drop by the description down below and take advantage of the seven-day mobility training challenge. This is a completely free mini course that teaches you and takes you through this systematic approach that we would want to overall redoing our overall mobility and improving that as a whole. But in the process, you'll learn a little bit about your body, you'll find things that you might not have known uh, really existed, or maybe you were aware of and you just didn't think they were problems. And this will identify those things for you and help you start to take steps in the right direction to resolve those things. Obviously, there's something going on if you're watching this video and there's knee pain coming on, so you might as well dive into it and see what you guys find down in the description, take advantage of it. And without further ado, let's go ahead and start to look at our systematic approach here to fixing this patellar tendonitis, that jumper's knee. All right, step number one, we're gonna look at the joints, but we're not looking at the knee joint directly here. Remember, it's a systematic approach. So the very first thing we wanna look at is your ankle dorsiflexion. Does your foot have the ability to connect to the ground well when we're landing, when we're doing those repetitive movements. If not, a lot of times what we find is that we're up in the ball of the foot and we're not balanced over the center of the, center of the foot, which is in turn going to put pressure on that patellar tendon from the southern side of the knee. So we wanna make sure that we have adequate dorsiflexion. And this is gonna help us restore dorsiflexion as well as pronation of the ankle so that we're able to basically connect to the floor well when we're landing, when we're running, whatever it might be that we're doing. So here you're seeing me drive the knee forward and open the hip also to test 
external rotation and pronation. So dorsiflexion and pronation are two big keys here that we're really looking at in this positioning. All right, joint number two that we want to look at is the hip itself. So now I'm anchoring that band down low on a post and placing the band up at the hip flexors that are in the hip crease. If the joint is not centrated, if it wants to travel anteriorly and medially, that's automatically going to be loading my quadricep tissues more. So we need to make sure that the joints are working together as a team. So I start by hugging the knee as deep as I can to the chest, getting full flexion as far as I can. Then I'm going to grab behind the knee and start to kick out. We're looking at the balance between my quadriceps and my hamstrings here. So I should be able to get that leg fully straightened by the end of these kicks here without letting the leg come out of hip flexion. And that's a big key. And then I'm also going to look at it in rotation here in case there's anything going on just above that hip in the sacrum, in the lumbar region of the spinal column. So I'll get some spinal traction in that lumbar range in rotation with the knee bent. I'm trying to get that knee toward the floor here. And the last one I'm gonna do is stick the leg straight out to the box and put my foot planted on the box so I have a straight leg once again, looking at that balance of the quadriceps and the hamstrings. Most importantly, we've addressed the ankle and we've addressed the hip, which usually when there's some imbalance there, that's when we see knee pains. All right, and finally, the third joint we're gonna look at is the actual knee. And what we wanna do is look at the knee in deep flexion here. So what I'm doing is a place to band high, just above the knee height, to provide some traction and spacing. So we're looking at flexion gapping here, actually providing space to the knee itself. And what we wanna do is as we sit in this position, as tall as we can, hugging that heel to our butt with the band right at the back of the knee, I'm trying to relax as much as possible. I wanna let that band open up the knee as much as I can without the tissues directly at the knee resisting the pull of the band. Now it might take a second or two to get yourself to feel comfortable in this and to actually get yourself to allow to relax into it. So take your time, and about two minutes even if you need or more to allow that position to really work in it. The last thing we can do here from this position is actually load up the foot and leg a little bit so you'll see me kind of prop up off the floor and that takes my knee a little bit farther over the toes and once again all about gapping the knee. All right, believe it or not, that was all step one there. So that was addressing the joints. Now we're gonna look at the soft tissues between the joints. And here we're starting to work at self-myofascial release of that rectus femoris, the one that we mentioned at the very beginning. So I'm placing that right over the foam roller and I'm gonna start with a pressure wave. I wanna take that the full length of the quadriceps. What this is doing is we're seeking out any restrictions, any points that are limited in their ability to glide in that area. So that might feel like pressure points or trigger points, anything that seems a little bit uncomfortable or kind of almost on the painful side, that's probably a point we want to focus on actually. So once we've identified those, we can start to bend and straighten the knee once we have that tissue tack down. So we pin that area down we bend and straighten to pull the tissues actively through. I wanna make sure in this position my abs and my glutes are engaged so I'm not holding it sloppily. It's almost like doing a semi-plank here while I'm doing this work on the tissues because we always wanna work in good positions. And then we can also work across those tissues laterally. So I'm kind of rolling that tissue through. It might feel like it thuds a bit at first as it rolls through there, but that should actually dissipate. And so should the discomfort as you're allowing yourself to actually relax into the foam roller more and more. So that should be the goal. How deep can we let that foam roller sink into those quadriceps tissues? allowing ourselves to relax and really breathing as much as we possible that possibly can through this position. All right guys, and finally we're on to step three here and that is restoring our muscle dynamics and movement patterning. The coordination of the movement is off and we're constantly loading the wrong tissues. I love to use the glute bridge here because it's an easy way to identify 
if this is true for us. In most cases, what we find when people are imbalanced in their uh, and off in their coordination is that their quadriceps and their hamstrings take the brunt of this glute bridge. Now it is called a glute bridge for a reason, guys. We need the glutes to be doing the movement pretty much to the point that it feels like that's the only thing that was flexing when we're in that top position. So if we're feeling our hamstrings trying to help out, if we're feeling our quadriceps doing the press here, that is off. The motor patterning, the movement, the coordination is off. So here, what we need to do is get the glutes to fire in that top position. And that's partially why I hold the top each time for about two to three seconds. You also wanna pay attention to what's going on at your lumbar spine. So every time I come back down to the mat, my low back should be flat. This is keeping my abs engaged. This also helps ensure that I'm truly hinging at the hip and not compensating at the spinal column for a lack of movement at the hip. So this is our big go-to to start here, getting those glutes activating, making sure that we're getting out of the hamstrings, getting out of those quadriceps in this position. Now, if you're having trouble feeling the glutes, here's a couple things you need to do. First, we need the heel as far as we can back to the butt. We can also add a loop band to the movement over the knees to help out here because as we drive the hips high and we're going as high as we can, we want to take any crease out of the hip here. As we drive the hips high, we want the knees to also drive wide. So there's two things going on, high and wide, high hips, wide knees, three points of contact from your feet with those heels close to your butt. It's first metatarsal fifth metatarsal and heel on both sides. So we have two tripods going on on each foot there, really balancing out, allowing me to drive straight down through the floor, driving up with my shoulder blades rolled down and back here as well. So it's a total body thing going on that we're looking at. The next position I like to assess is called a couch stretch. What we're gonna do is take the affected side against a box or a wall with the shin completely flat and the top of the foot against it. Here I'm showing level one with the hands inside the opposite leg there. So that right leg is out front, left leg to the back, my hands between. What I'm doing is contracting and relaxing at the gluteals. We're trying to restore balance to the glutes and the hip flexors. And here I'm doing it in position two, so I'm not completely vertical but our gold standard is completely vertical. So eventually, if you guys want completely healthy knees, we need to get to this vertical position. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This is where healthy knees are. If we can get vertical and restore where we're flexing and engaging those glutes in this position, you're going to be pain-free at the knees. All right, once we start seeing where we're at with those two movements and what's going on there, we need to start working on hinge specific movements and hinge specific patterns. Here I'm showing a basic kettlebell deadlift and I like using the kettlebell because it's a nice lighter lower weight to start with in most cases and it also has the higher height of the handle that most people can reach which is a little bit higher than a barbell or a dumbbell from the floor. In this position, at the top, I have my quads tight, my feet driving through the floor through three points of contact, the first metatarsal, the fifth metatarsal, and the heel, my glutes engaged, my abs engaged, and then the muscles engaged on my upper back, making sure I'm not rounding. Look at the hinge of the hips. There's barely anything going on at my knees here, and this is what we wanna train. We wanna be able to go into the hips with nice range of motion, and then restore where we engage the glutes at the top, loading the hamstrings. That's what we should feel as the hips go back. Once we feel very capable with those level one movements where it's very basic, we need to add a speed component. And this is where I like kettlebell swings because we're using a hinge, but there's a speed and power component to them. Especially if you're an athlete, we need to learn how to do this. And finally, plyometrics to rewire our movement patterning all together in an explosive, not only jump, but landing. So we need to be able to load those hips after a complete disconnect from the floor. We've gone from connected and being able to create that stability to now going disconnected and having to reconnect as we land. This means not letting the knees cave, loading the hips back, and making sure that we're able to absorb the impact 
in the hips rather than in the knees. This can look in different forms, so vertical jumps, forward jumps, these are all gonna be options that we need to learn how to train appropriately in the long run. All right, and there you guys have it. A mobility-based systematic approach to resolving your patellar tendonitis, getting rid of that jumper's knee for good. If you guys like this video, make sure you let me know by clicking that big thumbs up down below and take a moment to share it with a friend that you know suffers from something similar or the same thing and just it keeps coming back with them. Help them get rid of that as well. If you guys are interested in taking advantage of the seven day mobility training challenge, make sure you go by the description down below, click that link and sign up. It is 15 minute sessions, no equipment necessary, and you're gonna be learning a lot about yourself through the seven days here. As far as a study of yourself and the tissues and the joints, and if there's missing range of motion, it's all gonna be discovered in that. So it will help you identify the things that are putting you at risk for injury and overall just killing your performance in the long run. So take advantage of it. And if you have not already, take a moment and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on future content like this. Every Thursday I'm putting out videos showing you how to resolve those aches and pains, prevent those injuries, and overall optimize your performance. And it really doesn't get much cooler than that. Welcome to the Stronghold Army. I'll catch you guys next week.